I am Professor Lynn Porter of Fairfield University, and this is my lecture on scene design for my Intro to Theater class. Here is my overview for what I'm going to cover in this lecture. First, I'm going to talk about how scenery communicates and what scenery communicates. We're going to talk about the goals for a good scene design and then unpack the difference between background and environment, which are two very different concepts for scenery. I'm then going to get into the work that the designers do by talking about the specific tools that they use, space and scale and texture and levels. Then we're going to talk about the practical needs for a scene design and serving the director's overall vision. And then getting down to the nitty gritty of how a scenic designer communicates ideas to the artistic team with a ground plan and a perspective sketch and a model. So these are all the things I'm going to discuss in this lecture. All right, let's get started. So first up, what can scenery communicate? Think about that. When you go to see a play, when you are watching a movie, when you're watching television, what does the scenery say to you and what can it say to you? Well, most obviously, scenery can tell us where we are, that is locale or location. And some, some plays have very specific scenery. We're in this person's living room. Um, some plays do not have a locale. Some are just kind of nebulous. So that's, that's a big question for the scene designers. Are we putting this in a particular place or are we not? You can make that choice. Sometimes there is an historical period involved, um, and sometimes there's not, or sometimes we mix up periods. So what is, what is the historical period that, that we're depicting here? And then it gets down to the character level. What is the socioeconomic level of the various characters in the play? Or if going back to the example of a play taking place in a living room, think about all the living rooms you've ever experienced in life. They somehow express the character and the socioeconomic level of the family, or even more particularly, the characteristics of the person who really decorated that room or the, the person who's in charge of that room. If you think of all the dorm rooms you've ever been in, each one is structurally about the same. It's a room about that big. It's got beds in it. It's got dressers and desks. But each one is different. So that difference is one of the things that expresses the character of the people involved. And scenic designers think that way all the time. And then lastly, I want to talk about how the scenery can communicate the style and the spirit of a production. I've talked before about how representational or presentational the overriding style of a production can be. And this is where the, the rubber meets the road. Specifically, what are we trying to communicate? Are we going abstract? Are we making it look absolutely realistic? So where are we on our style spectrum? The scenic designer is in constant conversation with the director on all of these questions. And it all goes back to questions of, are we serving the play? Is this something that we are ladling on top of the play that doesn't grow from the play? That's not a good thing. But are, instead, are we finding something intrinsic to the play itself and bringing it forward and, and making it more visible to our audience members. That's the goal, to serve the play. And, and the scenic designer works with the director to make sure that the overriding intention of the production is expressed through the scenery. So what are the goals for a good scene design? Well, first of all, visually, the scenic designer is creating the world of the play. Designers use that phrase a lot. So where are we? When are we? What, what, what is the nature of the world of this play? And then it gets down to a question of style. What does this place look like? What does it feel like? What does it remind me of? 
So getting down to that question of style, all of this serving the overarching concept that the director has settled on, while also serving the practical needs of the text. There's a lot of practicality that goes into good scene design. Now I want to discuss two different points of view about how scenery should be presented. First, we have the idea of background and then the idea of environment. And I unpack this because there's frequently a misunderstanding in students about this function of scenery. Okay, so let's look at some definitions. When I'm talking about a background, I'm talking about two-dimensional pictures behind the actors. And here is a beautiful set. That is a background. This is actually what is called a wing and drop set. You literally have a backdrop. That's that beautiful painting in the center of the stage that is very flat, though, isn't it? If you look at the, where the, the backdrop meets the floor, you see it's a flat line. And then there is this illusion of a checkerboard floor, this illusion of these portals leading upstage to this very grand staircase and these arcades and columns and arches and oh wow isn't that beautiful and wonderful but it's very flat isn't it and then that's the drop part of a wing and drop set the wing part is if you look to the outer sides both stage left and stage right downstage of the backdrop you have what's called a wing or a leg that looks a little bit foresty it looks kind of like column with with foliage on it. Those are the wings. So this is a wing and drop set and actors can enter from upstage of the wings and perform in front of this backdrop. This is a very stylized form of scenery because as beautiful as this is, it is not at all realistic. It is very, very, very flat. No actor can enter from upstage center and come down those glorious stairs and come directly toward the audience. That can't happen. So it's a very flat, artificial look to scenery. Now, you may have seen this kind of scenery if you've been to a dance concert or to a ballet where the whole goal of the experience is to watch these amazing dancers move through space over time. And so dancers tend to need a tremendous amount of stage space and not a lot of obstructions to get in their way. So you do see this kind of scenery, the background kind of scenery in dance quite frequently. And I'm going to contrast that with the concept of environment. An environment we're defining as three-dimensional forms that surround the actors, that the actors can interact with. So it's a three-dimensional space. Here is a set model that is very environmental play the arsonists. So we have a scenic elements. We have a platform stage right with two people, looks like one person playing guitar. And this weird kind of arch situation upstage right, arch and chimney, and then some kind of a backdrop or situation where it looks like a, a vista of a town with a red moon or red sun. And then look, look downstage center where we have a chair and a table and a lamp, but then these eaves, this, these, this sense of the top of a house, stairs kind of going nowhere, a uh, long dining table downstage left, these columns. I mean, it's a very interactive space. Think about how all of the different ways you could move as an actor around on this space. This is interactive, this is three-dimensional. And it's not simply that this is abstract. It's the fact that it is a three-dimensional space that the actors can move up and down, up, back and forth on, and create different stage pictures. So in the overarching history of scenic design, the idea of background and those beautifully painted backdrops is really an idea from the Renaissance. Once 
artists got their hands around three-dimensional perspective, they realized they could make very gorgeous paintings of these beautiful spaces. But that is an idea from 500 years ago, 600 years ago. And as we moved into the late 1800s and then definitely into the early 20th century, the idea of scenic design moved from the idea of beautiful painted backdrops into three-dimensional environments that frankly offer more opportunities for realism or representationalism and then also offer great expressiveness with abstract work as we just saw in that image from the arsonists. Okay, so let's think about how a designer goes about creating these sets. So I want to talk about the scenic designer's tools. And I'm not talking about saws and screw guns and paintbrushes, though we use those in creating scenery all the time. I'm talking about the tools to actually do the designing itself. And I'm going to unpack this in four different ways. First, scene designers design space. They think about scale. Then they think about the surface, the surface treatment and the textures involved there. And then they deal with levels. So these are all elements of every scenic design. So what are we talking about when we're talking about space? First, there's the question of public area or private area. Is this action in this moment of the play best expressed in a public space or a private space? Is this scene going to be set in the middle of a grocery store? That's a very public space. Or is the scene going to be set in a bathroom? That's a very private space. You can do the dialogue in either locale, but, but the surrounding environment will affect how we as audience members experience that moment in a play. Then there's the question of where are we in time? Is this an historical space? Does this look like the throne room of King Louis the Fourteenth, Or is it a contemporary space? It, does it feel like it's happening right now? And then we even get down to the question of is this a real space or is this an imaginary space? Is this play taking place in the future? If so, we will have to imagine what that looks like. All of those amazing sci-fi films, all of those wonderful, strange zombie films take place in imaginary spaces. And then there's always the question of style. Is this realistic or representational? Or is it abstract in some way? Is it presentational? And how presentational should it be? So there's a lot of things that we have to think about when we think about the space involved in a scene design. So let's look at some examples. Here we see a set for a production of Shakespeare's Julius Caesar. It's got central pile of steps and platforms leading up to that center area. Two large columns left and right. These very big Banners, SPQR, um, that is the slogan of Rome, ancient Rome. Right, so we have some symbols from ancient Rome, and but it's obviously a very public space, isn't it? It doesn't feel like someone's private area. And if you think about the play Julius Caesar, most of it does take place in a very public space. What about a private space? Here we have a very intimate space from the diary of Anne Frank, where two families huddled in one attic during the Holocaust, huddled in a very private, intimate space. Here we see a very realistic style production of the play Picnic, which takes place outside two houses, if you couldn't figure that out. But there's something kind of private about this space, too, isn't there? It's limited to just this one area between these two houses and how these two families interact 
in this outdoor space. Here we see a very carefully researched, historically detailed, real space, a Victorian drawing room for a production of The Importance of Being Earnest, very funny play, but it's very definitely planted in a place and a time. So the scenery here helps communicate where and when we are. And we can contrast that with this set for an imaginary space, a space that's never existed in time, but we can imagine going there to Cirque Dreams. Or we can go to a conceptual design. This is an abstract design for a play called Lighty Breeze. It's set in a house in Nantucket in a very particular year, but it isn't real, is it? In fact, we have a platform up left that is raked. It's, it's got a, a slanted floor, but we also have the stairs going up, up to another level, the slanted wall. So it feels like a piece of a house, but it's definitely tipped, isn't it? That's not at all realistic. So it's got realistic elements, but it's not presented in a realistic way. And then what's going on over stage right? It looks like a big L. Oh, it's a corner of a picture frame. And it's a painting. It's a piece of a painting of a beach leading out to the sea, isn't it? And then we have this large downstage area that is open. So we have this kind of indoor-outdoor idea going on that's part realistic, part painterly. So there's lots of different ways that we can think about how we use space in the theater. Now let's think about the idea of scale. Scale is a question of how big something is or how small something is. It's very relative. We can also think of scale in terms of how empty an area is or how full, how crammed an area is. But whenever we talk about scale in the theater, we have one common yardstick in every play, and that is the fact that you will have human actors. So the height and the size of the human form is always the benchmark. So how big is the door compared to the person? Is it like four feet tall so the person has to duck to get into it? Or is the door massive so it's like the height of three people standing on each other's shoulders? Is it 15, 20 feet tall? You can have a door in any scale on stage, but how big or how small is it relative to the size of a human being? Here we have the example of a vast, open, empty space for a play like King Lear, that, that the space seems to swallow up the actor, and that's an intentional choice. And here we have the example of the set from, from a play called Curse of the Starving Class, where it's a tight space, it's a small, tight apartment, and the fact that there's all this junk crammed into this little space is a matter of scale, but it then puts pressure on the performers. It puts pressure on the characters, and that's part of the set serving the needs of that particular play. Now, in a play like Cats, where all of the human actors are portraying cats, that means everything else on stage needs to be bigger than life. I love that car battery down in the front, the diehard car battery. It's huge, but relative to the actors on stage, it's about the right size. So in order to do a play like Cats, you have to really emphasize the idea of scale. So I'll say it again, scale is always relative to the size of the human figure. So let's move along to surface treatment, the surface areas of a set. Texture is one of the main things we think about in terms of surface. One of the first questions is, are these natural textures or are these artificial human-made textures? Natural textures like wood and stone and brick and leaves and water and bone, they're all rough 
and they have organic qualities. They feel like Mother Nature grew them because she did. And even bricks tend to feel natural. Of course, Mother Nature doesn't grow bricks. However, she grows clay and humans shape the clay into bricks and bake bake the bricks. So I always put brick into a natural category because they have that warm, rough, organic quality. And that contrasts with the artificial or man-made textures. And these are really slick surfaces like glass and metal and concrete and plastic. You see how these contrast with the natural textures? The the Man-made textures also you know, tend to come with straight lines and smooth surfaces, unbroken surfaces. They can be slick and smooth and sometimes even shiny. So the, the human-made textures are very, very different feeling than the natural textures. And then this gets into a question of, is it a heavy texture or is it a light texture? Is it translucent? Does light shine through it like it does through glass or water or some, some forms of plastic? Or is it opaque and solid like stone is opaque? So how it plays with light is always a factor with texture too. And of course, when you're talking about surface treatment, you're also talking about color. So you can go with natural colors with all of the earth tone, wonderful browns and, and umbers that come with the natural textures. Or you can go with, with very uh, candy colored uh, items that might be found with plastics. So, or you can combine them. I just recently did a show that had a tremendous amount of stones that we painted in that show, but they were purple and orange and green and blue, and they were very candy colored. So it was a light, cheerful comedy. We were going with the natural texture of stone, but the unnatural or the artificial look of candy colors. So all of these ideas in terms of texture are very malleable in scenery. Here you have some natural wood textures, stone textures, gritty, worn textures, dull earth tone colors that help communicate how poor are these people in Les Miserables, right? The people in Les Miserables are plain old fashioned miserable. And the textures of this set, the textures of these fabric and this wood and all of this painted scenery help communicate that gritty, worn feeling. And I'll contrast that with these human-made textures of metal and glass and plastic, creating this, this steely office vibe for a very recent production of As You Like It at the National Theatre in London. Look how, how sterile these human-made textures make this space feel. I'm going to walk you through several photographs of this production simply because they played with texture so brilliantly. Here we see the set fully activated. We have our wonderful protagonist, Rosalind, there in the center. But you have everybody else in this weird office situation with the blazers that match the colors of the floor. So, yes, we still know it's a comedy. But... We, we have this very mechanical vibe going on, and that's even communicated through the ways that the humans are moving. The, the people in the pink and the yellow and the blue jackets, they're all moving in a mechanical way, and Rosalind is not. She's moving like a normal human being. Of course, As You Like It has a wrestling match at the beginning of it where a huge guy wrestles with a really small guy. And so they simply drag out a huge wrestling mat into the center of this world. And then the major characters decide that they're going to leave this world, or what Shakespeare calls the court, and they're going to, to run away to the Forest of Arden. And then all of the furniture lifts off the floor, and you realize it's all connected together. And the, that colorful floor slides out to reveal a really richly textured floor. 
And now we are in this fantastical, weird, wonderful, lovely, contemporary forest, the Forest of Arden. Another picture of a scene in the forest. So in this production of As You Like It, in addition to having both what's happening in town and then what's happening in the forest, that's an essential part of the play, they decide to take that cold, sterile feeling from the office and move it into the forest as they make this fantastical weird, wonderful forest of all of this furniture, there's still something steely and cold and not exactly inviting about this forest, you know? Here is another As You Like It, and they very clearly leaned into natural textures and natural colors and using light as a texture, and it's warmer, it's more inviting, it feels more fun, doesn't it? This production feels just lighter and more of a comedy. Now, both of these productions used the exact same words in exact the same order. The designers were responding to the same things from the text, but I hope you can see that the directors and the designers of these two different productions of As You Like It are plucking different strings that they're finding within the play. Here we have a photograph from a recent production of Waiting for Godot. If any of you have ever met Waiting for Godot, it is two clowns waiting for Godot. And spoiler alert, Godot never shows up. So it is a play about waiting. It is a play about the things we do while we're waiting for what's next. This recent production you're seeing an image from was quite famously done following Hurricane Katrina and the way it devastated the New Orleans area. So here you see random garbage as washes around during a hurricane forming the major scenic elements of the play. The stage directions for this play specify that you need a crossroads, a tree, and a moon. So here we are literally at a crossroad, and there's a tree of junk as these two characters wait. So these man-made textures create a very different sort of tree in this production of Godot. Okay, let's move along to thinking about levels. Levels are different places for characters to move about on stage, like higher levels and lower levels. And it's a simple fact of human nature that when one person is standing over another person, now you have a power dynamic going on. So levels can be manipulated by the director and the actors so that you can emphasize the shifting power dynamics within a scene simply by moving the characters around on the stage and getting some higher than others at different points in the play. All of this leads to dynamic stage pictures, that, that overall look of what is happening on stage right now. If you kind of dial back and think of it as just one, one picture, one snap that you take with your camera. You always want to have a dynamic stage picture and having various levels helps with this tremendously. And this is one of the things that is the downside to only thinking about scenery as a background. If it's a background, you don't have any levels going on and levels are, are one of the ways that we make for some really dynamic stuff visually. And levels can be used to focus the audience's attention. Where should be we be looking from moment to moment? We tend to look at what is highest. So the director knowing this can put the actors into positions where they are higher than everybody else. And we're automatically going to be looking at that. Here is the set for a production of Romeo and Juliet. Look at all those wonderful levels. It looks like if you go downstage to where the guy is standing down center with his back to us, 
You see, there's a long pathway across the very front edge of the stage, isn't there? And then there's a large central opening. There's a very definite stack of platforms, center stage. If we look to the left and right, we can see there's platforms leading to exits, stage left and stage right. And then we have this really dominant playing area up above that walkway over that central platform area. So we've got so many different levels here. And this is a moment in the play when the prince is talking to both families and commanding that they stop fighting so much in the streets here. Right? So we have definitely pulled our attention to that central area just by how actors are arranged on the levels. Here we have a production of Fiddler on the Roof that only has two levels. We have all of the villagers on this central main level. But look above. We have taken a wall of that set and we have tipped it and flown it out for a very unrealistic roof with a fiddler on top of it. Very abstract way of thinking about the fiddler on the roof that definitely calls our eye up, that definitely has a strange and marvelous poetic connection for us. So levels don't always have to be rendered in a realistic style, like we saw in that Romeo and Juliet. And here we have one of the funniest scenes in all of Shakespeare's canon, a production of Twelfth Night, where the standing figure, Malvolio, is in the garden, and he is a very pompous, overblown character. He thinks he's better than everybody else. And he has found a letter that he thinks is a letter to him. It's a love letter from the lady of the house. So he thinks that the lady of the house now has got the hots for him. Of course, he's been set up by all of the other clowns who are on stage, and they are now over, overhearing his delight. So it's a very, very funny scene as we watch this one character get punked, basically. And so the levels on this set allow for that to happen with all of this wonderful, weird maze kind of a situation going on with the levels. This is a production of Twelfth Night that really leaned into the idea of who's over and who's under, who's the boss, who's the servant, because that gets manipulated a lot with the characters in this play. So the maze idea overlaid the top of the garden idea, which also allows for the who's on top of the social hierarchy at any moment. All of those are manipulated in this production of Twelfth Night. On top of these elements of scenic design, we also have to think about the practical needs of each individual play. And what do I mean by that? We have to think about how we get actors on and off stage. Where are the entrances? Where are the exits? What kind of pathways does that open up for our actor movement? What properties do we need on stage? A, a stage property is, is a piece of furniture. Do we need a sofa? Is it a three-seat sofa or a two-seat sofa? Perhaps we need two chairs and an end table. So we have to deal with all of that stuff. You always need some kind of sitable on stage, generally. We also have to think about how we can keep all of the action visible to the audience. So there's a, a chunk of the stage that's not visible to every single audience member. So, so how do we keep things within sight lines? And then does the scenery change? If so, it, it might move from this to that. And how do we go about that? So we have to consider all of the practical needs that the design has to, has to satisfy. For example, with the play Dancing at Lunasa, we need to have a set that is both inside the house and directly outside the house. So we have simultaneous indoor-outdoor spaces and actor flow between the two. Here's a beautiful set for that play. That is a demand of the play text itself. As a set designer, we cannot simply say, you know what, I think all of this action happens inside the house. 
that's not the way the play works. That's not the way the play was was created by the playwright. So we have to make all of the playwright's needs work on stage. And think about Romeo and Juliet. You have to have some kind of a balcony situation, some kind of an up and down situation for those two young lovers to meet clandestinely. You have to have that. That's a very practical problem that's presented with Romeo and Juliet. With the play Noises Off taking place within this inn that is just door after door after door. There's actually eight doors on the set for Noises Off. The whole play revolves around people running in and out of all of those doors. As a set designer, you have to embrace that and figure out a way to actually make all of that work on stage. Noises All is also a play within a play, and the wonderful joy of this play is Act Two. We see the backstage version of what's going on directly off stage. So you literally see the front of the set for Acts One and Three, and then you see the back of the set for Act Two. It's hilarious. So part of the practical needs for a set for Noises Off is not only this runaround set with eight doors, we have to be able to turn it around and look at it from the backside. That's one of the practical needs of the play. So these are just a few very simple examples of the kinds of practical needs that, that a set design has to take into account. Okay, let's move along to the idea of serving the director's vision. We've talked before about concept and style. So assuming that the director has come up with answers to those questions, then the designer has to work within that system. So this is a matter of lifting up the themes of the play, put, uh, having a sense of the mood of the play, the style of the play, and what we want the overall play to feel like, we, what, what we want the audience members to be thinking about as they leave the theater having experienced the play. Some directors come up with their concept and their vision alone and then inform the designers this is the concept. Some directors also don't know what their concept or vision is until they've had complex conversations with the design team. Either way is a totally legit way to develop the vision for a production. Here's a photo from a production of Macbeth. Look at what they're standing on. Wow, it's a map of Scotland. In the play Macbeth, there are warring factions, and the question of who is the king of Scotland is a, is a major question in the play. So in this production of Macbeth, it looks like they are leaning into the political elements of the play. There's other elements of the play that the, the artistic team could lift up in a production, but in this one, they're looking at the political elements of the play. Another production of Macbeth might very well play with the idea that there are supernatural elements affecting the characters. That one probably wouldn't be performed on a big map of Scotland. We might lean into the idea of the supernatural and what that might look like. So the, the direction that the team wants to take always shows up in the set. In this silly French operetta, do you think that time has, is a factor here? Hmm, what do you think? Of course it is. Here we have an image from a production of The Cherry Orchard, where the actual cherry orchard is on stage. This play actually takes place inside the living room of the mansion on the estate that has a cherry orchard. But the cherry orchard is obviously something so big in this play that they took away all of the walls and left just the furniture of the living room because the cherry orchard itself, all of those trees are what is most important in this vision of this play. So the director design team can come up with an infinite number of great solutions to the problem. I, please don't think that scenery can be anything you want it to be. It still has to resonate with the ideas and the themes that are baked into the play script itself 
and that the the director wants to wants to lift up and show the audience. This is one of the things that makes every production of a play totally unique from every other production. So let's think about all of the different ways that a scene designer communicates their ideas to the team. I keep talking about the team here, and what that is is the artistic team. That is the director, the designers, the actors, everybody involved in making the artistic choices involved with a production. And there's three principal ways that a scene designer goes about communicating what the set's really going to look like. Obviously, at some point, describing it with words kind of falls apart. You can't just wave your hands around in the air and describe things. You have to have, to have documents that say this is what it looks like. So a ground plan is a drawing that is a bird's eye view. It's looking down on the stage floor. So it's looking at the stage floor. Where are walls or platforms or steps or columns or pieces of furniture? So a ground plan is, is the single most important document that a designer draws. Then there is also a perspective sketch that is calculated from one seat in the audience. So if you are sitting in that seat, this is what you're going to see on stage. And so it's a perspective, a sketch of everything going on on stage. And then designers also build models. And we do this two ways now. But a model is a three-dimensional version of the set. Remember those dioramas you made in fourth grade in a shoebox? It's a, it's a very advanced version of that. But it's a three-dimensional thing that you can hold in your hands that when you look at it very carefully has all of the platforms and steps and columns and sofas in it that you're going to need on stage. So we physically make these three-dimensional models, but because we're now in a computer age, we can also make them digitally. We can make a virtual model in a computer that we can then move around with and, and look at from multiple points of view, but it is a, a file in a, in a computer. So we also have the ability to make virtual models. Both are the best way to say, this is what the set's going to look like, this is what the set's going to feel like. Here we have a ground plan for the play Top Dog Underdog, and in the center you have this platform that is the, the living room of the two men in the play. Around the stage right, stage left, left, and downstage sides, you see all of the seats in the theater. This is obviously a black box theater where the, the seating is arranged individually for each production. Then the, the bold lines you see on stage, those, those are walls that, that are so bold you can't walk through them. You can see steps up to the main platform. You see indications, oh, that's going to be a brick wall. That's going to be some kind of hanging light fixture. This is the hallway. This is the central area. And then if you look at the main playing area, there's a rectangle for the cot and a small rocking chair and a recliner and sittable boxes and crates on the downstage corner of the of the set. And then even off the edge of that platform, there's a whole bunch of junk drawn in that looks like, and you see notes, it says exterior, rubble, trash, etc. So, so there's a bunch of junk arranged off the edge of this platform. So this is a detailed ground plan of a design for Top Dog Underdog. And here is a three-dimensional model of that same set we just saw in the ground plan. So you see how both of these, these uh, renderings express something different. This is actually a, a 3D thing. You can see the little person standing on stage. You can see the cot and the chair and the other chair and the junk around the edges, right? So this is a three-dimensional model that is painted exactly like the set will be painted. So this communicates a tremendous amount of information to the directors who are trying to figure out how to manipulate actors on this stage, to the actors themselves, even to people in the scene shop. How am I going to paint this? What colors should I be using? 
Where should it be darker? Where should it be lighter? There's a tremendous amount of information that's being communicated in this model. And there you go. Now here is a production photo from that same production. You can see that the designer changed their mind, right? That the walls seem to be a little differently colored than what we saw in the previous image. The model and the, the show photos often are eerily similar. Here we have another example of a way that a designer can communicate their ideas. This is a perspective sketch for the original production of Amadeus. So this is a drawing drawn from the center of the audience, from the center of the house, and it's looking directly at the stage. So what am I, what am I going to see? What are the angles that I'm going to see? What does the person look like here or there on the, on the stage? And I want to point out, in both the perspective sketch and in the model, we always include at least one human figure because that human figure helps establish the overall scale of the piece. And here we have a production photo of that same design for Amadeus. How lovely is that? Obviously, the lighting designer is putting all of this textured light on stage. It's kind of modeled, but it's again kind of eerie how that perspective drawing looks exactly like what we're seeing here in the finished design. Part of the scene designer's training is learning how to make ground plans and learning how to draw in perspective and learning how to uh, paint. So all of this is part of the training we have for designers. Here we have another 3D model from a production of Ma Rainey's Black Bottom. Obviously, this scene design really leans into the idea of levels. We've got multiple locales in this play, so this is what we call a unit set. We have a piece of the house. We have a piece of the exterior. We have the piece of this, a piece of that, right? So all of those different pieces are arranged to create one set. So the characters can move quickly from locale to locale simply by moving to different parts of this set. We don't have to deal with set changes with this kind of scenery. Here we see a set model for the strange play end game that very much emphasizes the idea of texture. And even those diagonal lines in the background, that's actually part of a backdrop. That is obviously part of this design too. So your set model is a strange little version of the real thing. And here is one more way that designers communicate with the, with the artistic team. This is called a white model. And it's simply called a white model because it hasn't been painted. So it is the colors of whatever materials the designer used to literally make the, the model from. It still shows scale. See, there's still a person up there standing on that porch. It shows scale. It shows the spatial arrangement. We can see clearly that this isn't a thrust. So we have a strong sense of what this feels like, but it just hasn't been painted yet. So that's a white model. All right, that's a lot, isn't it? So we've talked about how scenery communicates, what a goal for a good design is, how background and environment are two very different things, the designer's tools, the need for a set to deal with the practical needs of each individual play while serving the director's vision. And then in these last couple minutes, I've talked about how the scene designer communicates ideas to the team. And that's what I wanted you to know about scene design. Thank you for your attention.